you're glad to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Can you say amen? I wonder if we could stand together and why don't we join in singing a few choruses. Let's begin with the one that Jim's been playing. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. How many know in the Lord Jesus you're a new creation tonight? Can I see? Come on then, let's sing about it together. I'm a new creation. today and was making a visitation call, and while I was there with a man that uh, is facing certain death, the doctors didn't give him through the weekend to live, and he looked up at me and he said, Phil, you know, I know it's time to go home, and I just wanted to tell you that the thing I've enjoyed the most about our song services is when you've let us have that one minute to go around and shake people's hands. He said, I love to bring visitors to our church just so they can see the warmth of our love when we go around and do that. Let's do this right now tonight while the musicians are playing. Will you go to two or three, extend a hand. Don't be singing. Go to them so you can say to them, I'm glad to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. Will you do it while they play? Greet one another in the Lord's love tonight. Now help me sing it again, all right? Let's clap and make a joyful noise. I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. God bless you all. You may be seated. I want to teach you a new chorus. We haven't got the overhead projector, but I believe the words are easy enough that you can learn them. How many like to learn a new chorus? Good. This is a good worship chorus. The words are very simple. 
And it says this. Maybe you want to jot them down so you won't forget them. It says, I will crown you, Lord. I will crown you King of kings. Jesus, you're my life, and you're Lord of everything. And then it just repeats that. So let me give you the words, all right? I will crown you Lord. I will crown you King of kings. Jesus, you're my life, and you're Lord of everything. How many like what it has to say? All right, let me give it to you again. Some of you are still writing. You went to day school and can't write at nighttime, so we'll go real slow. I will crown you Lord. I will crown you King of kings. Jesus, you're my life, and you're Lord of everything. And then it just simply repeats that, all right? Now, some of you know it already. We've learned it at the Apple. We learned it this summer at camp. And those of you that do know it, you lift it up and help me teach those that don't, all right? I will crown you, Lord. I will crown you, King of Kings. Jesus, you're my life, and you're Lord of everything. I will crown you, Lord. I will crown you, King of Kings. Jesus, you're my life, and you're Lord. 
very, very much. Let me just make a test. One other thing, when I turn into this, are we okay back there, Steve? All right. Those of you who have your Bibles, I would like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I want to read just two or three verses, and perhaps you'd like to follow with me. Let's look at verse 2 of the 14th chapter. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. Would you underscore that in your Bible? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. Then look in verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. What does that mean? What does the word edify mean? Builds himself up, blesses himself, strengthens himself. So look at verse 4 again, and maybe you want to underscore that. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Look at verse 5. I would, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, I would that you all spoke with tongues. Maybe we ought to read the rest of the verse, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. But let's don't stop there. Except he interprets that the church may receive edify. Now jump down to verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Now, there are three things that every believer ought to know about this subject of speaking with tongues. Three things. Let me just jot them here on the board. Three things that is extremely important. needs to know concerning speaking with other tongues. Now, if you do not know these three very basic things, then you're always going to be in trouble. <clears throat> Here's the first, first thing that you want to write down. Speaking with tongues accompanies the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat that. Speaking with tongues accompanies the baptism with the Holy Spirit. In every single case in the New Testament where there is evidence of a person or people receiving the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, there was speaking with tongues. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came as God's gift to the world and to the believer, not only were they wonderfully and gloriously converted, not only did they hear the word of God that Peter preached, not only did they agree to be baptized in water, not only were they filled with the Spirit, but they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they all speak with tongues. That it was at the birth of the church when God brought the church into existence. Now, when we turn to the 10th chapter of Acts and Peter is preaching and is sharing the gospel at the household of Cornelius, once again, the Holy Spirit, so beautifully present, 
And we know those believers received the Holy Spirit, and they were not only converted, but they were baptized. And again, it was, the experience was accompanied with the speaking in tongues. So it was to the Jew, and then it was to the Gentile, and then in the book of Acts, chapter 19, we, we find the Apostle Paul at Ephesus. And here are believers that had been baptized in John's baptism, a baptism of repentance. They were rebaptized in the name of the Lord in water. They were rebaptized. And then Paul laid hands upon them, and when they received the Holy Spirit, after their acceptance of Christ, when they received the Holy Spirit, they too spake with tongues. The Apostle Paul was converted, and he speaks concerning this glorious experience of the baptism. And when he shares concerning the baptism, he, the Apostle Paul, is able to testify and say, I speak with tongues, and he said this to the church at Corinth that was speaking with tongues so out of order and so much that he had to write to them and correct them. But he said in the process to that very church that he was correcting because they spoke with tongues so much that there was no order in the church. His testimony was, I thank God I speak with tongues more than all of you. So, you know, he had to be pretty busy in this ministry to be able to write that kind of a testimony. He says, I would that you all speak with tongues. Now, each time that we find any reference to the experience of the baptism, now not the infilling of the Spirit, there is a difference between being filled with the Spirit and receiving the experience of the baptism. This may come as a shock to some of you, but there are some people that have received the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit and have spoken with tongues that are not living a Spirit-filled life. And this may come as a farther sh further shock to you. There are some people that have never known the experience of the baptism with speaking with tongues that do know what it is to be filled with the Spirit, and they bear evidence that they are filled with the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit accompanies their life. Now that has to really, there has to be a real distinction made between our being filled, because there are many fillings, and our receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is a singular experience. There is only one baptism in the Holy Spirit. You don't receive many baptisms in the Holy Spirit but you do receive many fillings of the Holy Spirit. And I've said this before, there are many fillings because there are so many leaks. That's the reason Paul said when he's talked about being filled with the Spirit, said, be being filled. That's in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17, 18, 19. Be being filled. It's a process. We have to stay in the place where the Holy Spirit can continuously fill us with His presence and His power and His goodness and His mercy and His grace and Himself. So every time that there is the experience of the baptism, you will see accompanying that experience this manifestation of tongues. Someone says, is that the only evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Oh, no, no. A hundred times no. There are many other evidences. But this is the first outward, the first physical evidence that you've had the experience. The, the experience, the, the, the blessing, and I'll explain in a little moment why that's necessary. But the moment that you receive the baptism and your spirit is baptized by our Lord the outward evidence that that has happened will be that you will speak with tongues. There are many other evidences. It's too bad that there is such an emphasis on tongues to the confusion of a lot of believers. So that's the first thing in this study that I want us to notice, three things that every believer ought to know about speaking with tongues, that the speaking with tongues accompanies the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that is so tremendously important that we grasp that. Now, 
The second thing that's important that we know, and I'm just writing one word here to sort of get it started, there is a difference between tongues in our private life and tongues in a public ministry or tongues in the church. And when we confuse the scriptures from 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in this matter of the difference between private and personal and public tongues, when we begin to confuse those scriptures, then we get in a real muddle. For instance, let's look at verse 2. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. However, in the Spirit, and notice the translators have very properly translated that word spirit with a little s, not referring to the Holy Spirit, talking about the spirit of man. In man's spirit, he speaks mysteries, not to men, but to God. Now there is a beautiful explanation of tongues in the private life of an individual. What is the purpose of tongues in the private life of an individual? Well, the apostle tells us, He that prophesieth, verse 3, speaketh unto men to edify and to exhort and to comfort. Because anybody that prophesies speaks in a language that every listener can understand. But, in verse 4, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Because he's not speaking to the understanding of the people that are about him. It is his spirit communicating with God on a level that is beyond our own mental capacity. That's what makes the experience of the baptism which is so limited. It broadens our capacity to communicate in two directions. Let's jump down to verse 14 and you can see it very easily. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Please draw a circle around that. If I pray in an unknown tongue, not the Holy Spirit, my spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. Now, listen very carefully. You see, we as, as human beings are made up of three parts. We are a body, we are a soul, and we are a spirit. The mind and the understanding and the mental process is a soulish quality. It's a soul ability. The rich man that died and, and went to hell, he was there not physically, he was there as a never-dying soul. And the rich man in hell had his mental capacity. He could think, he could remember, he could reason, he could pray. He did pray. Too late, but he did do it. And he could remember what happened to him. He could think. That's one of the things that's going to make hell torment because everyone that goes to hell is not going to go into oblivion. They're going to carry their thought process and their reasoning ability and their memory along with them. So when we can only pray as it relates to our understanding, we are limited in our praying to our ability to understand. But when we pray with our spirit, our understanding is unfruitful. If I can carefully use this word and not be under misunderstood. When we pray with our spirit, our understanding is bypassed. It is now a communication on a level higher than and more powerful than our own mental process. It is the human spirit responding to the spirit of God to pray in a language that does not make sense to the mentality, but is a communication to God as we speak in mysteries to God, things we do not understand. That's the reason when we're praying along, those of us who are English speaking and an English understanding people, and we're praying in English and we've said all we know to say, 
and there is this tremendous burden of prayer and we don't know how to communicate or even how to pray about it, there is the beautiful capacity to suddenly pray in the language of the human spirit. And when we do, as God's Spirit touches us, our prayer ministry broadens fantastically. No one has ever prayed with his human spirit as the Holy Ghost has moved upon his spirit, but what he has been satisfied in his prayer life. How important it is that we see that and not let some people, because they, they, they have been taught so many negative things by people who do not even understand what has happened. So this ministry of tongues in our personal life is a broadening first of our prayer life and of our prayer ministry. Oh, how often those of us that have received this experience of the baptism and have had the ability and the privilege and the glory of moving from the understanding to the Spirit and the human spirit begins to communicate to God and we don't disturb other people with it because we're not speaking to other people. We're speaking to God. It's a private, personal experience for our own edification. How beautiful it is and how powerful it is when you can get people praying in that kind of a dimension. Now, it's not only in prayer that it's magnificent and beautiful in our private life, but in our praise. How many of you in your effort to praise God have felt so totally unable and unable to express yourself in praise and you felt like you were almost going to burst if somehow you couldn't express yourself. Well, this brings this dimension uh, out of the limitation of our mental capacity and of our reasoning facility and puts it into the spirit where suddenly as we praise in tongues, the broadening and the release of spirit becomes powerful and pleasing because we are not limited by the mental process. Thank God for that dimension of praise. We need to learn this in our own personal lives, in our own private devotion, not just in the church. We need to learn this in our own prayer life and in our own praise life so that when we're in our automobile or we're in the bedroom or we're in our closet of prayer, we can pray first with the understanding then with our spirit, praise with the understanding, praise with the spirit. This is what Paul said. Let me read it again. What is it? This is verse 15. What is it then? He asked the question. And then he answers it. I will pray with the spirit. How many of you in this audience have ever prayed with your spirit? Beautiful. See a church filled with people that say, yes, I've experienced that. You only experience that because you received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if I were asking people in this room tonight who have not been able to do so, and those of you who would honestly put your hand up, you would be saying, I have not received that experience. If you receive the experience, you are going to have this dimension of prayer. That's the reason the experience has been given to you. Otherwise, why have it? How many of you in this congregation have praised God with your spirit? What a dimension. What a release. What a blessing. What a privilege. And what a depth. And what a dimension that God has given to us. Now this is personal, private tongues for our own edification and it does not need interpretation. Now, I've been listening to some teachers that say, pray in tongues and then pray that God will give you the understanding on what you pray. And I, I, I am sorry, even though I know that there are some very qualified teachers teaching this, I have a very difficult time scripturally accepting that. Because if God is going to reveal to our understanding what we're praying about, let him reveal it in the beginning, then you don't have to pray in tongues. 
the tongues praying is to move us into a dimension that's beyond our mental capacity. That's the reason the tongues is even there in the first place. So we can edify ourselves over and beyond what our own mental process and our own uh, understanding facility is capable of. That's true in prayer, and it's also true in praise. Now, let's talk a little bit about tongues in public, because that's, that's the difference. There is a difference between tongues in our private life that does not necessitate any kind of interpretation. That's for our own benefit. It's between us and God, and we're not to disturb the church with it. It's to be done privately, personally, in order, decently, dignified. It's to be done in a way that is pleasing to God and is in no way offensive to anybody that might be around keying in on what's happening to us. Years ago, there was a man that was alongside of a woman praying at the altar, and she was very beautifully and quietly communicating with God with her spirit. She was praying and worshiping in tongues and disturbing nobody. And here was the man right next to her that suddenly started listening. And after he listened a little bit, he reached over in his confusion and touched her, and he said, you know, you're praying along there, and I don't know what you're saying. And she very sweetly said, I'm not talking to you. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said. Now, publicly, we run ourselves into altogether a different situation because Paul said, I would rather speak just five words with my understanding that I could communicate to you than 10,000 words in tongues in, out here in the church and you not understand it. He said, people come in from the outside and you're speaking in tongues and there's no interpretation. There's nobody that's able to communicate to the audience what's going on, so nobody's edified. Everybody's confused. And Paul used strong language. He says, you even become as a barbarian to me. It's like someone blowing on a trumpet and they don't give a certain sound. And they were filling the church up with that. The church at Corinth had gone to such excess that the whole church, well, just, oh, they were having a great time releasing their spirit and, and nobody being edified except the individual. So Paul zeroed in in that church and he said, now look, there must not be any outbreak of public tongues unless several things happen. Number one, you must be convinced it is not for your own edification, that it is for the whole body. And don't you speak unless you know in your spirit and in your mind that that message of tongues is for the whole body of believers. Well, that's the first qualifying statement. The second qualifying statement is this. There must be an interpreter. Someone on the same spiritual wavelength must wait until the tongues has been demonstrated and manifest, and then they must tell the congregation what has gone on. If not, then there is confusion and the body is not edified, and Paul said it would be better that you prophesy so the body can be edified. So there must be an interpreter, and if there is none... Either the speaker in tongues must interpret or he must sit down and be quiet and just admit that he made a mistake. Now, don't get disturbed if mistakes are made. The only people that make mistakes are people that are doing something. I would a whole lot, letter, or a whole lot rather correct a mistake than to preach to people that won't do anything. It's a lot easier to correct a mistake than to try to jerk someone that's dead not responsive at all and get them to do something. And that's what Paul was doing with his church. He was correcting the error. He said, look, and then more than this, remember this, that no tongue and interpretation and no prophecy is infallible. For, because Paul said, once there is that kind of a demonstration in the body, those that are spiritual judge whether or not this thing be of God. 
Now, hear me very carefully, church, because I want to say something here that's really important to us as a local body. When we sense that a demonstration has the witness of God on it, the moment that that manifestation is over, we need to respond with worship and praise and thanksgiving to God. If we don't respond, we are judging that it's not of God. Therefore, we are resisting it. Now, if we resist something that is of God, then we are quenching the Spirit of God. Are you listening? I look to the elders. Thank God for our spiritual men. And if they began responding in worship, that bears witness that spiritual men say, we judge this, we say this is of God. And the whole body needs to become sensitive so when there is that manifestation, there is a witness of spirit upon it. Now, if you don't feel that, and you sit back and say, well, I don't feel that, then you, are, you say, I'm not going to be the judge. I'm sorry. You're the judge. You spiritual people are automatically the judge. You're the judge that everything is A-OK -okay if you respond. You are judging that it's not OK if you don't respond. So you see, you're in a spot. It's like those of you in this audience that don't know Jesus Christ. You're in a real spot because you can't walk out of this sanctuary and be neutral. Everyone in this room that does not know Christ is going to be forced to a decision whether you want to be or not, whether you want the decision or not, because the preached word brings you to that decision. You either have to be a Christ acceptor or a Christ rejecter. No choice. You're saddled with it. It's one or the other. And every one of us that walks out of this door is going to say one of two things. I receive Christ or I reject Christ. No neutral ground. Now, I'll talk more in further studies about this difference. But God help us to read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and see the difference between the personal experience, the private experience, the private privilege, and the public ministry. And then he qualifies it one other way, and I'll talk about these in a further study. He says, let there be two messages, at the most three, and then from there on out, no more. Because the spirit of the prophet, the spirit of the speaker, is subject to the speaker. I refuse to listen to people who say, God moved on me and I had to do that. There was nothing I could do about it. That is not so. God never violates the human spirit and the human will. We only do it because we submit to it, and we must not submit to anything that's not according to the Word of God. If it's not in this book, then we must not permit it to happen. Now the third thing, and then uh, we'll talk more about it in our next study. I want to emphasize, number three, that tongues is the language of the human spirit. Your spirit can talk. Your spirit can communicate. And your spirit can communicate with God. Your spirit has that capacity. The moment that you are born again, your spirit is made alive to God, and that spirit can communicate. And when you communicate, with your spirit and begin to speak with tongues, that is your human spirit communicating with God, and it is a beautiful vehicle for spiritual mysteries to pass between you and God. Oh, listen. Thank God for what the Holy Spirit is doing around the world today and across denominational lines where today there are thousands and thousands of people that have been moved into this beautiful experience and into a liberty and a blessing that they never had until they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and their spirit was free to communicate as God would have the spirit to communicate. It's for you. It's for you. God wants you to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. John, did I quit on time? Good. How many learned something tonight you didn't know about the tongues? Did you? Good. 
How many knew all this, but it's just good to hear it again? How many wish you'd have been preaching? <laughs> Alda, did you want to preach? She stuck her hand right up, said she was, she was preaching. And it so shook Art up, he reached over there and grabbed her and says, Oh, no, honey, you don't want to preach. And he knows that she preaches enough at home. Do you know that I will really be blessed if I can get you before we have baptismal? We're going to do that just right here. I, I, want, I want you to let the Lord speak to you. I asked the Lord tonight to give us a certain amount in the offering. And it was, a, it was an amount way over and beyond what ordinarily comes. And we're only a little over $300 away from that amount. And I... I'm going to ask us all to stand, and if the Lord just speaks to you, you come up here and hand it to me. And I'm going to believe God for the balance of what we need. Can we stand together? And then we're going to baptize. And I am, I'm always excited when we baptize believers. But you just wait till tonight. We've got some things to tell you. And man's going to make us walk in heavenly places. I, I'm going to stand here now and believe God for $300. Who's going to bring something? Come on, do it quickly. Say, I don't want to let my left hand know what my right hand's doing. Well, stick your right hand in your pocket. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't this fun? Thank you, honey. I'm a conqueror, victorious. I'm reigning with Jesus. I'm seated heavenly places with him. With him, for the kingdom of God is within me. I know no defeat, only victory. Oh, the kingdom of God is within me. I know no defeat, only strength and power. I'm a conqueror, victorious. I'm reigning. Thank you, preacher. With him. Thank you, sister. I know no defeat, only victory. I'm a conqueror, victorious. I'm reigning with Jesus. I'm seated in heavenly places with Him, with Him. Oh, the kingdom of God is within me. I know no defeat, only victory. I want to ask you a question. How many of you know that all you have to do is to believe God for your salvation, to ask Him to forgive you for your sin, and the moment that you obey, that there comes an awareness in your heart that you're saved. How many know that's the way it works? How many know you don't have to come down in front of the church for that to happen? How many know that can happen out there where you're seated? How many believe God can save you in your car? Or in the bedroom? Or the bathroom? Or the swimming pool? How many know you don't come up here and kneel down in front of a preacher? Don't you have to say anything to the elders? How many know it can happen in the hospital? It can happen in the baptismal tank. How many know that? Okay. Listen, let me tell you something about, <clears throat> about the baptism. There's no hocus pocus to it. The same Lord that's your Savior is also your baptizer. And all you've got to do is say, Lord, will you baptize my spirit? Now, since your spirit has been made alive because of new birth, 
your spirit now has the capacity to respond to the Spirit of God. That's the reason Paul says, his spirit bears witness with our spirit, and we know we're a child of God. How many have had that witness? How many have had it sometime today? Now you see, every Christian, you ought, you, you ought to sensitize yourself. God wants to bear witness with your spirit over and over and over and over again. I have, I have yet to ever worship God but what I didn't have that witness of spirit. Dear Jesus, I love you. I don't have to say that but just two or three times. Sometimes I don't even get it out of my mouth. There it is. That's sweet. How many know what I'm talking about? I wish you'd act like it. <laughs> Do you know that as a Christian, when that witness of spirit comes, if at that moment you would be obedient and thank him right then for baptizing you and would respond to that prompting and not speak English, but speak whatever God quickens to you. In response to that witness, you would receive your baptism just so simply it happened on the church, just so beautifully and blessedly, so marvelously. You know, God doesn't come zeroing in and zapping you and boom, there it goes. He doesn't do that. Are you about water soaked up there? Okay. Well, I'm talking about the baptism in the Holy Ghost.